It's always nice having Lonnie pray over you. You know, it's nice having anybody pray over you, but he always gives a good hug while he's doing it. I'm a hugger. We're going to be in Acts chapter 11 this morning. We almost taught it a couple weeks ago, but then we didn't. Oh, man. Finally, the warm weather's here. Hopefully to stay for a while. My mom's coming in town from Canada, so it seems like every time she comes, the cold weather follows. And I'm like, come on, God. Give us a break. We'll be here Tuesday because my middle little, Kyrie, graduated high school back in December. I just can't even believe it. Um, She's getting old, but I'm staying the same, you know, like it feels like it anyway, except whenever I try to move around, it hurts a little bit. Acts chapter 11. Wasn't that some good worship this morning? I really enjoyed it. Acts chapter 11, it starts out in the, the, the description that my Bible has is Peter explains his actions. We've been going through the book of Acts, and uh, a lot happens in this, this particular book. I mean, a lot of firsts happen in this book, and this particular chapter that we're getting ready to cover, man, there, there are some significant firsts that take place here. I don't know, do you guys, are you guys um, reading ahead? Probably not. There's only a few kids in school that would ever read ahead, but hopefully you are. Hopefully you're kind of familiar with what we're getting into because it's so deep in this chapter that um, I'm going to try to cover the whole chapter, but you guys are going to have to go back and you're going to have to like dig into it a little bit deeper for yourselves. But hopefully I can bring out some cool points for you. It starts out, it says, Soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. Receiving the word of God, what they're talking about here is, is they found out that, that God is moving in the Gentiles. So the God that we're talking about here is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the God of Israel. The God of Israel has moved against so many other nations on behalf of the Jews, on behalf of Israel. And there's never been a time in history that they have seen a Gentile be able to have these all the blessings of what Jesus Christ did, okay? Of what God the Father did. There's never been another time where Gentiles were able to have the, the full blessings of the Almighty God, of Yahweh, right? And so what we're seeing here, Peter, Peter went and ate with these guys and saw God move in their lives, and that word spread, and it got back to, um, it got back to, I guess I could just read it, but yeah, I'll just read it, and then we'll cover it. Sorry. It says, but then Peter arrived, so they heard about it, and then Peter arrives back in Jerusalem. The Jewish believers criticized him. It says, you entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. They're like, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? And it says, then Peter told them exactly what happened. He says, I was in the town of Joppa, Remember, he was staying with uh, um, uh, Simon the Tanner. And he said, and while I was praying, I went into a trance, basically. He like, have you ever like started to see visions or maybe dreams? Maybe you're drifting off. Anyway, they call it a trance in this translation. He said, I go into a trance and saw a vision. Something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners from the sky. And it came right down to me. When I looked inside the sheet, I saw all sorts of tame and wild animals, reptiles and birds, and I heard a voice say, Get up, Peter, 
kill and eat them. No, Lord, I replied, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish law has declared impure or unclean. But the voice from heaven spoke again, Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. This happened three times before the sheet and all it contained was pulled back up into heaven. All right, so let's jump into this just real quick. We'll hit it a little bit more here in a minute too, but Peter is explaining himself. Has, have you ever done something you knew was right, but then you had to explain yourself? Before you explained it, whoever you're talking to, whoever it was, thought that you did something wrong. But then you have the opportunity to explain it, and they're like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. But you don't know what they're going to say. You don't know what they're going You don't know how they're going to respond. You think you're right. You feel that you're pretty right. I mean, obviously, Peter knew that he was right here. But you have to, you're kind of put on the spot. It's like, ugh. But then fortunately, these guys gave him the opportunity to actually um, lay out what had happened. And this is so significant because, first of all, if you think about where Peter was, he was at Simon the Tanner's house. In the Jewish law, like, Jews couldn't touch anything that was, was dead. You couldn't even be around it. They were... If anybody did touch something dead, they were considered unclean for a certain amount of time until they went through the ritualistic purification process, right? And so he's staying at a dude's house that's pretty much always unclean because he's always touching dead things because he has to skin it, he has to clean it. You know, he's, he's literally tanning hides. That's what he's doing. But if you don't understand the background there, it's like, huh. But Peter was staying there. They didn't say anything about that. But then it says... While I was praying, so Peter literally lived a devoted life of prayer. He was always praying. He was always spending time with the Father, which is great. But at this point, God shows him something. God starts to reveal something to him. And what he was revealing to him, Jesus had, had made reference to, had talked about multiple times while he was in his ministry here on earth. And Peter was right there with him. But remember how the Word talks about how... Um, they weren't able to see, they weren't able to understand, and it even says that God um, made it to where they couldn't see and understand certain things, you know? But, so, what, what God is showing him here, he's showing him the, the animals and stuff, he's letting them down, um, letting down these, these animals that there's no way they were allowed to eat, okay? And, um, something that uh, my friend Walt brought up one time a while back, I hadn't even considered it, but, um, you know, Jesus is the one showing them, showing Peter that he can eat this stuff. But Peter says, I've never eaten anything that our law says that I can't eat. And that tells us, you know, like we as Christians today, we know that, that we can eat whatever, you know, God made that very clear for us that it's not unlawful for us anymore, but but even while Jesus was here on earth, he never ate anything unclean. He abided by the law. He did. And I was like, wow, that's an interesting point. You know, and I've thought a lot about that. I've processed through a lot about that. But Jesus deals with us. God deals with us at a rate at which we can handle things. He gives us a little bit, works, works through that with us, gives us a little bit, works through that with us because... Don't you know that if, if he tried to take care of everything all at once, it'd just be absolute overload for us. There's no way we'd be able to do it. And, and this is an interesting thing because God gives him this vision and tells him that you can go ahead and eat this stuff, all right? You can, but it's like baby steps because right after this, three Gentile men show up the sheet comes down three times and says, you can go ahead and do this. And then right after this, three Gentiles show up and want him to come to the house. I think it's like God was just making these baby steps for him. 
Look, take little bites at a time. Chew it up, process it, swallow it. You can't swallow the whole steak at once, you know? And so um, I love how he, he says, I've never done that. I, I can't. I've never done that. You know, this is my tradition. I can't do that. It doesn't feel right for me. It doesn't say that Peter went right out and started killing these animals and eating them, right? But it does say that um, he told him, look, kill, eat, it's okay. And the voice told him, too. God was speaking directly to him. It is interesting. And it's just like Peter, too, though, to say, no, Lord. <laughs> You're having a vision from God. He's speaking directly to you. And you say, no, Lord. Remember whenever Peter said, far be it from me, Lord, that will never happen. You will not, you will not go to the cross without me. Same Peter, same guy, you know what I mean? So we have kind of a pattern there going. It says, but the voice from heaven spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. Up until this point, God hadn't made it clean. Didn't tell him that he could up until this point. But also, at the same time, up until this point, we are all Gentiles. We wouldn't have been able to come into this covenant with God. And it hadn't happened yet. But God's changing things up for us. Thank God He did. Wow. This happened three times before the sheet and all it contained was pulled back up into heaven. Just then... Three men who had been sent from uh, Caesarea arrived at the house where, uh, where we were staying. Keep in mind, Peter's talking to these people that didn't believe what was going on, and they were actually coming down on him. He says, The Holy Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry that they were Gentiles. That tells me that Peter wouldn't have went if the Holy Spirit wouldn't have said, Go ahead and go. These six brothers were accompanied, uh, had accompanied me. So pretty much Peter and Paul, whenever people would go around, because the way that, that the gospel was spread at this point was people literally traveled around, and fortunately most of the time they went in groups, one for safety, but two I think for support, and Jesus set out the fact that we should go out in twos. It helps, you know, you've got that support, you've got one another to help lift you up. But he says, these six people that are right here with me, they're six brothers, so that tells me that they were Jewish brothers. They accompanied me, so anytime anything in the Word is going to be proven, you have to have two or more witnesses to make it a fact. That's just the way that it's always been, and that was even their rules or their laws set forth in the law of Moses. But he's like, not just me and one other guy, there's these six other guys with me, that they saw what had happened here. He says, And we soon entered the home of the man who had sent for us. He told us how an angel had appeared to him in his home and had told him, Send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He will tell you how you and everyone in your household can be saved. This is so cool. One of the things that I find so interesting about this is the fact that before God ever gave Peter the vision of the sheet being let down, before he told Peter to go, God had already talked to the Gentile. God already talked to this man and told him to send someone to Joppa to find Peter before Peter was even there doing what he was I mean, he was at the house for a while, but before God ever spoke to Peter to go, he spoke to a Gentile to send for him. I love that. And if um, I don't remember how much Rod covered uh, the story about Cornelius, but that is such an awesome, awesome story. I wish I could have kind of went into both, but that's such an amazing story. He was a God-fearing man, and the Jews in that community... They loved him. He even actually helped build their, their synagogue. Super cool guy. And God, God spoke directly to him because of the way that he treated God's people. His heart. God was already looking at his heart. 
Thank God he, he judges us by our heart. And he, he wanted Cornelius. God wanted Cornelius. He didn't only want a, a basic relationship with Cornelius. He wanted Cornelius to have the Holy Spirit. He wanted his spirit in Cornelius and in his family. Is that not exciting? Like, God wants relationship with you. He wants His Spirit in you to be with you all the time. And this is like the first of this, this whole thing coming about. It's so amazing. So Peter is telling, God, God already gave him the vision and had him send people to come find me. And so I went. He says, just then the three men show up, blah, blah, blah. Um, he will tell you how you and everyone in your household can be saved. This, this is so awesome. As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. He's talking to dudes that were in the upper room when the Holy Spirit happened, when Pentecost happened, and, and the Spirit falls on them, and they're all baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they're starting to speak in tongues. He said, that same thing that you experienced, they experienced. I watched it. These six guys watched it. <laughs> oh, man. He says, Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? I wasn't going on my own behalf. I was going to go do what God called me to do. And if God wants them baptized, what am I going to do? <laughs> Why would I stand in the way? That is so awesome. <laughs> Who was I to stand in the way? And then it says, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. Yes. Yes. We have the opportunity to repent of our sins and receive the gift of eternal life. This is when it started for us. Super, super awesome. Man, I love this. One thing that I found really interesting is he's talking to the leaders of the Christian church in Jerusalem, which at the time would have been James, the brother of Jesus, and uh, some of the other, uh, the other believers, but also some, some of the, the Jews from the circumcision that had also converted over to Christianity. Okay? So when, when you are so steeped in something, and it's, it's, it's your tra not just tradition, but it's your law, it's your way of life. It's literally what you've been taught, what your parents have been taught, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, so on and so forth, for hundreds of years, and you've been walking this, and you know that it's right because God gave these things out, you know, and you know that it's the right thing to do. To transition out of that into the, into the freedom, not completely out of that. I mean, they still, there's still so much that God honors whenever they're, they're doing this. But to transition out of that and accept the fact that God's allowing other people into this now, whenever it, just used, it used to just be me, you, and nobody else, you know, like, no, they can't come. Some of the, uh, some of the Egyptians were actually left Egypt with the Israelites, mind-blowing, you know, but they're like, all the gods we've ever served can't do what you're doing, so we're going with you. Um, and so, some of them could and some of them couldn't partake in the feasts and different things. Now, God is, is He's broken all that down. He says they can come in. They can. And so, these guys, they're, they're trying to grasp the fact that so many things are changing, that God really is doing so many things. But they're, they're being tested, I guess. You know, tested to see what, how much they can handle. 
And there's a big difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees and then these guys, because the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they absolutely denied, they refused. They've been looking for their Messiah forever, and whenever he's right there in front of them, they don't see it and they don't accept him, you know? But these guys, they have a big thing going for them. They've got God's grace, God's mercy, His forgiveness, they've experienced it, and they've experienced the Holy Spirit, okay? So God is helping them transition through these phases to understand that God is opening this up for everybody. But I understand that it was difficult, but the difference between them and the Pharisees and Sadducees is they, they said, you know what? Okay, we're open-minded. We see that God is doing something different. He's proving himself, and, and we believe. It goes on in, in verse 19. It says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene became, uh, began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of the Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. So that whole meanwhile, it, it's shifting from Peter talking to the leaders in Jerusalem. Now it's shifting and it's, it's giving us an account of what had started to happen all over the world, all over the known world at the time. And, and I tell you the known world at the time because it starts to list out all these different places, Phoenicia, Cyprus, uh, Antioch of Syria. All these places are a long ways away from Jerusalem. They're a long ways away from where they just got pushed out of. Okay? And what's so interesting, in my opinion, about this is it says, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death. Okay, that's, a, that's an important part to understand about this because remember how Stephen died? He was stoned to death, right, by the religious leaders? And right here in Acts it says, and a young man, Saul, who was taking the cloaks, agreed with what happened. Okay, and then he goes out and he's, Saul of Tarsus starts to persecute Christians and stuff all over that scattered people all over the place. They were worried. They were concerned in fear for their life, and rightfully so, because their persecution was way different than our persecution today, obviously. They were being killed and murdered and tortured and, and put in prison and their families, all kinds of crazy stuff. So they scattered out everywhere, and it says some of these people, most of these people, only spoke to the Jews about their Christian faith. These people believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And they, they started to speak to the Jews about it. They didn't waste their time speaking to the Gentiles because no Gentile had ever you know, had this opportunity before. What's interesting, though, uh, also interesting, is the fact that the, the Jewish people were the ones that were persecuting and killing them. So they flee somewhere because of persecution, then they go and do the same thing, that they were getting ran out of town for, but they, you know, they were bold, and that's how the word started to truly spread. And Jesus told his disciples up on the mountain, he says, I want you to go out into Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, spreading the gospel. His, his disciples, though, didn't go. They stayed right there in Jerusalem. And it wasn't until the persecution started to hit big time that people started to spread out. And if you look, it, it's pretty clear that the disciples were still pretty close to there. Some of them started to go different places, and whenever they did, they got murdered, most of them. But it says, however, some believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. They're like, what has happened to me is so incredible that I'm going to tell everybody about it. I can't not tell everybody about it. So they even started speaking to the Gentiles about this. They didn't know what happened with Peter. They didn't know what happened um, with Cornelius and his family. But they were, they were so passionate about the change that God had brought in their lives, they started talking to everybody about it. 
That is, that's exactly what we need to do. That's exactly who we need to be. And it says, the power of the Lord was with them. And large numbers of Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. This is, this is super cool. It says, when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence, they sent him because they wanted, they wanted proof from, from the inner circle. Somebody go and find out, is this actually happening all over the place? And Barnabas was trustworthy. So um, they sent him, and when he arrived and saw the evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit, and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. So, Judea, or the West Bank, I, I like looking up like how far these places are and stuff. I just geek out on that. And uh, it says that it's about four hours and 17 minute walk from Jerusalem. So, uh, that's where he went out. Not too bad. Four hours, 17 minute walk, whatever. But, then it says... Barnabas starts encouraging them, okay? Barnabas is a leader. He, he traveled around with, with Paul a lot. We, we see a lot more about Barnabas, Barnabas later on uh, in the travels and in the ministry of Paul. And they teamed up a lot, and they changed literally the face of the known world at the time, and even, even our world today. Things that they did have impacted what we do today. And so Barnabas is, is teaching and training and encouraging and, hey, keep up the good work. And then he's like, I haven't really experienced any of this before. Here's these people out here preaching to Gentiles and they're coming to the faith. And he's trying to, basically he's being like the, uh, uh, the news guys, you know, the news anchors that go out into the, into the war zone to see like, What's actually happening? What's really going on here? And he had to send word back too. But then as he's out there, he thinks, wait a minute. When Saul of Tarsus got converted, you know, Barnabas was one of the first people. He's, Barnabas is the one that brought him to, the, to the, um, the leaders of the church at the time to prove that he had actually been converted. That's that was Barnabas' role right off the bat. And so he remembered, wait a minute. Paul said this was going to happen. He said that Jesus told him that he would be sent to the Gentiles. I got to go find Saul. I got to go find Paul, right? I got I to gotta figure out what's actually going on here. So he's being the investigator. So he goes, it says, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. To look for Saul. He didn't know where he was at the time, but he knew he was from Tarsus. And they had, a, they had developed a good relationship by this time. That's how, that's how Barnabas knew that Saul would probably be in Tarsus. Because he had a good relationship with him. He's the one that took him to the hideout in the first place. Whenever he was getting ready, Saul was going to get killed by the, by the Jewish leaders. He's the one that took him to the hideout to protect him. It says... When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. He's like, dude, you got to see what's going on over here. This is crazy. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. I think that's pretty neat, like going back to the, back to the root of it, you know. But he goes and gets Paul. He's like... These guys, they've started preaching and, and speaking to Gentiles, and they're starting to believe. And you said that God was going to use you to reach the Gentiles. It's already started here. Let's go, let's go there, and let's really build this thing up. Let's make this thing happen. Let's see what God's doing, you know? And so they stay for a whole year, and that's exactly what they do. They start building up the church with these Gentiles. I just had a thought, but it wouldn't fit right now, and I'm hoping that I don't forget it. <laughs> like, remember that, remember that. 
So they were teaching large crowds. That's where Christians, they were first called Christians. It says, during this, during this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. Some prophets. One of them was named Agabus, stood up uh, in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. You know, we're all about um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and people operating in those, but I don't know about you, but I like the happy prophecies more than I like the, the bad prophecies. <laughs> but Agabus stands up and he's like, I got a word from the Lord. And they said, go ahead, share it. He says, a horrible famine is going to come on the entire Roman world. And they're like, oh, that's not good. But Proverbs says, there's an old proverb that says, if a, uh, a wise person sees danger coming and they prepare for it, but a fool sees it coming, they continue on and they pay the penalty for it. Well, God is telling them something bad's about to hit and you guys need to prepare for it. It's just like the dream that, um, that he gave that Joseph was able to interpret and then prepare, you know, the seven years of, of good, uh, good years and then the seven bad years. Jesus is doing the same thing. God's doing the same thing here and giving them a warning. It says that this was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius, Emperor Claudius. So the believers in Antioch, they decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. Not as much as, you know, they thought, well, I can do without this. They gave as much as they possibly could. It says, this they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. So, one thing that, that I kind of pulled out of this is, as you're following through this timeline, you see that God is bringing all these Gentiles in as well. And there was a lot of wealth in the Gentile world at that time. Lots and lots and lots of wealth in the Gentile world at that time. And these Christians, for the most part, didn't have a whole lot because they had all been kicked out of the synagogue, out of the, um, the community of the Jewish people. And the synagogue and the Jews, they took care of each other really well. They did take care of, they tried to take care of the widows and the orphans and stuff. But once you were excommunicated from that, you were excommunicated from your opportunities to be able to partake in the benefits of being within that community. And they're kicked out. So we know that, that uh, a lot of the, the Romans and stuff, the, the Gentiles around that time, they didn't associate much with the Jews because they had been shunned so much by the Jews. Now the Jews are shunning these Christians too. So they're, if they own businesses and those kinds of things, they just didn't have as much as... as the rest of the world had at that time. But they're getting ready to go into this famine, and God had brought these people in to relationship, into covenant with Him, and they are they're seeing that their brothers in Jerusalem and in that area are going to have a really, really hard time coming up. And so they said, hey, we can do something about this, and we should do something about this. So they put together... Um, funds to be able to help support these people during that famine. That's one of the great things about this word, about the Bible in general. You know, it really is a, a roadmap of how we should live. It's a roadmap of, hey, this is what's right. This is what's wrong. And if you follow this, you're going to be blessed. When you give with a cheerful heart, you're going to be blessed. Um, Whatever you give is going to come back to you, good, bad, or indifferent. It's going to come back to you, whether it's financially or, or serving people or just a cheerful attitude or whatever. Like, what you give will come back to you. And something I was doing a Bible study a while back on Titus, and this brought, 
that section back up to me. So this obviously happened before Titus did, but in Titus, it's uh, chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. It says, um, Do everything you can to help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. So he says, do everything that you can. These people, they decided to do everything that they could. Paul's telling uh, Titus to do everything that you can to make sure that they have everything they need. It says, our people, us, we as Christians, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Isn't that interesting? He says that, that we have to learn to do that. We have to learn to devote ourselves to doing what is good. What is good is, is helping out your brothers, is helping out your, uh, your families, is helping out um, people that God put on your heart to help out. Um, Ashley, you posted something the other day, and uh, it was about giving. You said people that, do you remember exactly what it was? Sorry if you're watching online, I'm going over here. No, it was about um, if you give and you don't have, it's love or something like that. When someone helps you and they're struggling too, that's not help, that's love. I was like, oh, oh, that's so good. When you help somebody that's struggling, and you're struggling too, that's not help, that's love. Man, that just hits home, doesn't it? God is love. God helped us when we we're struggling the most, without hope, without anything. Thank you for posting that. It really did impact me a lot. There's so much more that I could get into with this, this whole chapter here. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to. But I do really encourage you guys to get back into it, like dig into this before this, at this chapter, right after this chapter. They're, they're so, so good. Um, unfortunately, the next chapter, uh, James gets killed. And that's a pretty rough time. Peter gets in prison. Herod realizes that it pleased a lot of people, so he starts trying to kill a lot more people, and things got really, really bad at that time. But this is, this is the beginning of starting to see Christianity take off around the world. And if you remember, whenever, uh, right after Jesus was killed, they were... They were wanting to kill more of the Christians, and uh, one of the leaders said, hey, listen, you know, we might as well just let this ride, because we've seen it happen this time, this time, this time, and it just fades off. It just fades away. And so we really don't need to worry about it. If, if it's just another one of those deals, and this isn't true, this isn't real, well, then it's just going to fade away like everything else it always has. But if it is real, and we continue this, we're going to be contending against God. I would say they were already contending against God because they were full of pride, and the Word says that pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. They were already in opposition to God, but... One dude is like, hey, <laughs> this might not turn out so good for us. Um, guys, we do serve the true, living, risen Savior. The King of kings. The Lord of all lords. When you really start to think about it. He created everything. <laughs> everything. 
That's so amazing. And he still created us. Chose to and wanted so much to have a relationship with us that he did everything so that we could. I just love, what an awesome God we serve. Well, that right. Man, if I was a singer, I'd start singing that. What an awesome God we serve. Or mighty God we serve. What a good song. What happened to that song? We should sing that song. Brittany's like, don't tell me. <laughs> Brittany. Come on, Brittany. What a mighty God we serve. Anybody have a tambourine? Somebody always had a tambourine during that song, right? <laughs> yeah. Kim, get up here. You can keep a beat. <laughs> Let's go. Almighty God we serve, angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him, what a mighty God we serve. Yes, man. Thank you, Kim. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. We can't comprehend how mighty he is. We can't comprehend how mighty the God is that we serve. Your earthly mind. Thank God that we're going to get new bodies. Hopefully a new mind comes along with that. I can't remember what I did last week even, you know. But um, I had to ask Brittany, I said, hey, what did I wear last week? I don't want to like show up wearing the same thing again. That'd be kind of weird. But um, she's like, I don't know. And I said, me neither. It was last week, people. It was just last week. Oh, good. <laughs> Pam said, we don't remember either. It doesn't matter. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, you know, I hope that this, uh, that this chapter, for sure, encourages you. Does anybody have any, any questions or anything that they want to add to it? Like, anything that stands out in this chapter that, that I didn't cover that you're like, you know what? You didn't cover this, and it's one of my favorite parts. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, I did. It was about the um, the Gentiles actually having quite a bit of money at that point and them giving as well. You know, the Word says that God will take from the wicked and give to the righteous. And if Satan steals something from you, he's got to repay it sevenfold. Sevenfold, take it, dude. You're just going to pay it back, you know, <laughs> with interest. Yeah. All right. Well, tomorrow night, we've got a bunch of the churches coming together here at 7. Um, isn't it such a blessing that God has started to bring the churches of this community together, whether we have the same name or maybe all the same ideas on how we should worship or whatever? He's still bringing us all together. I think it's a monumental time in Harrisonville. It's a monumental time in Cass County. You just don't see this. What's happening here, you just don't see. I've never seen it before, but he's bringing all these churches together for one purpose, one mind, and that's to go out and love God and love other people. Share that with them. It's so awesome. We have this Adopt a street initiative. Some people are going out and, and we adopt these streets and, and we get to go talk to everybody on the street. But guys, listen, I understand that we're all in different places. Like uh, some of us, it's absolutely impossible to try to go out and, and walk these streets. And, and it's just not, uh, we're not physically capable to do that sometimes. And that's 100% fine because you know why? Prayer changes everything. And we need people to come together with us in prayer. We need people, even if you can't go out and, and meet these people, you can, you can pray and you can send the Holy Spirit out before us. It says He will go before you. He will prepare the way for you. We need you guys, all of us, to come together and pray for all the people that, that are able to go out, whether they're with our church or not with our church. Like they're going out to share the love of Jesus with people. So all these churches, a bunch of them are going to be coming together here uh, tomorrow night at 7 to pray together. So if you don't have anything going on, come out, you know. If you can't come out, pray where you are. 
okay? Pray for what God is doing in this community. Pray for what God is doing and has planned to do in the hearts and and lives of these people. When Brittany and I went out um, the other day, we got to meet multiple people in our uh, on our street that were doing the same thing in other they already had their streets their church is doing it and they're like hey we want to encourage you guys we, we're going to be praying for you guys too you know that's so encouraging to run into people that you know it, I'll be real honest with you I can get up here and talk in front of people but that doesn't mean that I still don't have some anxiety whenever I'm going up to knock on a door of a total stranger that's never met me before and start trying to just generate a, a, um, a relationship out of thin air. That can be a little stressful. You know, Kim gets worried about getting bit by dogs or something. I don't know. Like, I'm not so worried. I'll, I'll take a dog out. Like, <laughs> let your dog out on me. <laughs> People have before. It's been interesting. But... Not not doing the adopted street. That was that was in a different career, so we won't we won't get into the story time on that. But there are some interesting stories. But seriously, guys, like, um, what we need the most is to partner with God on this, and God partners with us in prayer. That's what He does, and. Uh, So if you can, definitely come out tomorrow night. I'm sure we're going to have some time of worship, some time of prayer, some time of encouragement. Um, But uh, it'd be cool to see you guys. If anybody has any um, prayer requests, praise reports, anything like that, please feel free to come up. Um, We'll be up here to pray for you. The elders will be up here to pray, and and, uh, we'd love to pray with you. We'll have one more song. I didn't pick one, Steve, so you can pick one back there. But uh, we'll have one more song. If you can stay, you can feel free to stay. If you need to leave, you can go ahead and leave. Um, Don't forget your kids. And also don't forget that we love you very much. It's so good to see all of you. Good to see you guys too. Yes, sir. Pray for Israel. That's right. I don't know if, uh, if anybody's seen the news. I didn't hear about it until we were driving here this morning. And Brittany's like, did you see what happened in Israel? And She's like, Israel got attacked. I'm like, they've been getting attacked every day, you know, since October 7th. But um, she's like, no, no, like, Iran is attacking Israel. Huh? They are protected, and we need to continue to pray for their protection. Yes, sir. Right, with the Iron Dome. They said over 100 missiles were fired, uh, 90 of them were taken out with the Iron Dome. Yes, ma'am? Some of you probably can't hear what she said, but um, I'll just repeat it so you, you will understand. The Iron Dome is the most incredible technologically advanced uh, anti-missile system on the planet right now, and it shoots down missiles and drones and things that are trying to come in and attack Israel, but uh, unfortunately, it can't stop the shrapnel. Like, it blows the things up in the air, but what goes up must come down gravity, right? And so, it still rains stuff down out of the air, and a little 10-year-old boy yesterday got struck in the head um, with some shrapnel, and um, he's in critical condition right now. Who knows if he'll live or not, but they do sustain a lot of injuries from things that continue to fall out of the sky. And, you know, the U.S. the U- and the U.K. are pretty much the only ones right now that are trying to help at all. Um, but they were talking about drone attacks and stuff. They're, they're getting attacked um, with aerial uh, defense. And... It's one thing if you've got some terrorist organizations, you know, Hezbollah, Hamas, um, ISIS, these, these types of organizations trying to attack. But it's another thing whenever you have a country trying to attack that has an air force, that has um, more sophisticated things. And, it, and Brittany and I were talking, and it's like, man, it, it looks like what's going on is ramping up significantly before the November elections. Like, who knows how that's going to go? I mean, 
Some people probably know exactly how it's going to go, but but we don't for sure. And right now, uh, it's it's understandable that they're attacking right now because um, honestly, we're just not helping our allies the way that, in my opinion, we should be. But it is just my opinion. But I mean, anyway, I can't get on this pedestal. I gotta, or we'll be here all day. <laughs> okay. But please do pray for um, pray for Israel. Brittany's concerned. She's like, "Uh oh, Nathan's going over," but not over time, overseas. <laughs> All right, well, let's pray. Mm. Good morning, Father. God, we love you so much. Thank you, Lord, that we still get to gather together in your name. Thank you that you meet us and you're here with us in our midst. You never leave us. You never forsake us. Like Brittany said, even whenever things don't go right, in our minds, you're still with us. God, and that just gives you an opportunity to treat us like your children and, and help carry us through these things. Lord, help us to just bring you glory and honor in everything that we do, God. Help us to represent you well. God, and I just pray that, that you will just put an intense fire in us, Lord, to draw closer to you, to help others to draw closer to you. God, and I just pray that you will help us to impact our areas of influence, that you'll help us to impact the world around us, to show them who you are and to love on people and, and show them your love for them. God, I pray that we will be the best version of who you've created us to be. Lord, I pray that you will just pour out your Holy Spirit on us and in us in ways that we've never experienced before. God, I pray for a refreshing baptism in your Holy Spirit. I pray that you will move on this earth like you've never moved before, God. Lord, I pray that you will give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Help us to understand what you're saying to the church today and help us to be obedient to what it is that you want us to do, even if it doesn't seem to make sense to our human minds, God. Give us the courage, God. Your word says to not be afraid. Not be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. For you will go with us. Lord, I pray for our, our uh, meeting with the churches tomorrow night. God, I pray that you will go up here just in a, in a way that re will reveal your glory in such a powerful way, God, that we, we can taste you and see you, Lord, that we, we feel you, Lord that we can experience you in a way that we've never felt before, God. Help give us the, the ability to open the eyes of the blind, the physical and the spiritual. Expand our tent post, Lord. God, we love you, we appreciate you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.